This is where I've been half tempted to say a woman who needs no introduction. That's how I wanted to start out, but I'm going to do a full introduction. In honor of Dr. Lynn Kaminsky, our very own Dr. Lynn Kaminsky, she is filling in because our speaker originally for this date had to cancel. And um, as is um, as is her MO, her modus operandi, um, Dr. Kaminsky cares so much about this department that she was willing to step in at the last minute. And I, as a member of the department, am thrilled because I have never seen this talk. And this is something that, that, that a talk that, that our Dr. Kaminsky gives. Um, well, look at this, I wrote that down, but I, I said I'm personally thrilled. So this talk on, on the science of war and peace uh, is the topic, and it's just perfect for what physicists do, and I'm surprised it wasn't in the series already. Um, Dr. Kaminsky is the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at SSU, and as we were just talking about, for 15 years, that's the longest tenure of any chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, so that's actually a good <laughs> Her bachelor's degree is from Brandeis University and her PhD is from MIT. Her early work um, was on X-ray, astrophysical X-ray sources, transient sources, and uh, X-ray binaries. She joined Sonoma State University in 1986 and founded, um, uh, actually more than a decade later, but founded the, um, the preeminent education and public outreach um, uh, group here at Sonoma State. Um, that group, and uh, because of Lynn's uh, dedication and devotion to, to these um, topics in science and astronomy, has um, worked on projects such as the Fermi Space Telescope, the Swift Space Telescope, and uh, more recently, LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory. Um, her accolades are, as I put down here, too numerous to mention. I suppose wrote too, almost too numerous, and I looked at it and I said, they actually are too numerous to mention. So I cannot go through her accolades, um, but a few things. She's a fellow of the California Council uh, on Science and Technology. She's a, a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, preeminent um, bodies. Um, recent awards um, she's received include the 2015 Sally Ride Excellence in Education Award from the American uh, Astronautical Society, the 2016 Education Prize from the American Astronomical Society, and the 2016 Wang Family Award um, from the CSU system. So let's give a warm welcome to our very own Dr. Kinsley. All right, thank you. Yes, it's, it's my pleasure to give this talk that I normally give in the fall semester to the War and Peace folks. Um, I've been doing it for, gosh, at least 20 years, I would, have, I would guess. And you might wonder, well, you know, why am I posing with that statue of, or the sculpture of Fat Man, which is one of the first nuclear weapons. Um, my interest in all of this nuclear stuff began when I was still a postdoc at Berkeley. And I was looking around for another job, and I had briefly toyed with the idea of going to work at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Because my thesis work, which was about the thermonuclear explosions in the surfaces of neutron stars. And so a lot of the physics is the same if you then have the thermonuclear explosions, you know, in bombs, like somewhere near Earth. And so that made me a very attractive candidate to that organization. And I was looking at three different divisions of that organization to work at, the fission bond building division, the fusion bond building division, and the policy division. That was the only one that I actually thought of that I might want to work at. And so I went out and I did a lot of research, and I do not have a security clearance, so everything that I know that I'm going to tell you today is all unclassified material. And so I went out and did a lot of research to learn all about weapons as opposed to neutron stars, and also to learn about a lot of the politics that was going on with respect to things like nuclear non-proliferation treaties. Now, this talk has evolved a lot over the past 20 years, and I am not going to be able to tell you all the different things that have been in this talk all of these different years, because some years the talk is more about power plants, for example, um, one of my staff today reminded me that it's the anniversary of the Fukushima accident in Japan. 
And so during the years when that was the top nuclear related news, I would talk more about power plants and I would talk more about what, what happened at Fukushima. But every year I basically pick one topic that I think is the most important topic from a political point of view, and I end with that, and this, and this year North Korea wins again. So sometimes it's power plants, sometimes it's Iran, sometimes it's North Korea, this year it's still North Korea. So with that uh, preamble, that, that exhibit is not at the art gallery anymore, but it was last fall when I gave this talk in the morning piece series. So I'm going to talk a little bit about history, then I'll do a little bit about physics, the fission and fusion, and the effects of the weapons. And then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about what's, what we know about what's going on in North Korea. So that won't be quite as physics-y, but there's still some physics in there. Okay, so where did atomic weapons get started? <coughs> Basically, World War II, the timing of it, coincided with what physicists were finding out about the inner workings of the atom. So this is, you know, the late 1930s, say. And the physicists that were studying the atom figured out that it was possible to release huge amounts of energy by either breaking apart or smashing together the nuclei of atoms. Far more energy can be gotten out of nuclear processes than can be released in chemical reactions, which only involve electrons. So what would Einstein do? By by 1939, many prominent, mostly Jewish physicists had fled Europe and had come back to live in the USA. And Einstein signed a letter to Roosevelt alerting him to the potential of weaponizing nuclear reactions. But until Pearl Harbor happened in 1941, the USA did not really invest very much in research into how to weaponize the physics that the people were doing in the lab. But after Pearl Harbor, after December 7, 1941, they, the U.S. began the Manhattan Project uh, because they were really worried that Nazi Germany, which also had all the remaining non-Jewish physicists that were working on nuclear reactions, would be weaponizing the science. And of course, the Manhattan Project was not really in Manhattan. It was, it was located near Los Alamos, New Mexico, and, but it was, called, it was like a code name. So most of the funding that went to the Manhattan Project went to actually build the factories to produce the materials that you would need to make bombs out of. Not paid to the scientists that were working on it, because building factories cost a lot more than paying some people. And the first successful test was called Trinity, sometimes also called Gadget. And that was in uh, July of 1945 in nearby Alberta, New Mexico. Okay. So, now, some science. Nuclear physics versus chemistry. Chemist, so here's, here's a helium atom, right? Two neutrons, two protons, two electrons. This is the, the, Bohr, the Bohr version of the picture. And if we were going to be doing chemistry on this, we'd be talking about removing these electrons or adding more electrons. But if you're going to do nuclear physics, you're talking about changing the nucleus, what's in the nucleus. So either changing the number of protons or the number of neutrons. The typical energies involved in chemistry are of order electron volts, you know, 1 to 10 electron volts, because you're dealing with electrons, and volts are a unit of potential. So electron volts are a unit of energy, roughly 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Right? Joules are our standard SI unit of energy. But nuclear physics, the typical energies involved are millions of electron volts, or MeV, capital MeVs. So for example, if helium loses one of its protons, it becomes a different element, because the number of protons in the atom define what element it is. So this particular one here, this would be tritium. So it's got two neutrons and one proton, which makes it hydrogen, but it's very heavy hydrogen because it's got two neutrons in it. Or if helium instead lost one of the neutrons and still had the two protons, it would still be helium, but then it's an isotope of helium, it's three helium. The, the weight comes from the combined number of protons and neutrons, so the weight's still the same, but what element it is depends on how many protons you have in the nucleus. And yes, I'm in a room with a periodic table, so that's a great thing for this talk. 
So some of the materials that you'll hear me talk about today include this very heavy hydrogen, tritium. That's one of the things used in fusion weapons. Deuterium, which is regular heavy hydrogen with only one <coughs> neutron in there, also used in fusion weapons. Uranium, okay, so if you go out and you do some uranium mining and you get some rocks out of the ground that have uranium in them, what you're going to find is that more than 99% of that uranium is what we call uranium-238. Now that's not a particularly useful isotope of uranium to use for nuclear weapons. What you really want for nuclear weapons is the much less stable uranium-235. So in this talk, when I have something in red, it's because it's one of the main ingredients for atomic weapons. So uranium-235 is only less than 1% of what you would find in that rock in the ground that you just pulled out of a uranium mine. But yeah, that's what you need for both power plants and for fission weapons. And another main ingredient for fission weapons is plutonium. But plutonium is not a naturally occurring element. You will not find it in any rocks in the ground that you choose to mine. Um, you make it instead in power plant reactors, where the uranium in the power plant reactors turns into waste that includes large quantities of plutonium-239. Everybody doing good so far? All right, so if we want to get some uranium, we're going to mine it as ore from some open pits or some deep shaft mines. Sometimes you put some solutions in there to get it out of there. And then you take it to a mill and you crush the ore and you extract the uranium, which leaves behind a whole bunch of radioactive sludge, tailings, that just pile up and stay there in those states that have the mines. And a lot of those states that have the mines, the mines are located in land that is um, part of a Native American reservation. And so a lot of the reservations are heavily contaminated with all the leftover stuff from the mining. That's a whole other talk. Can't go into that one now, but just making that point. So then you get this extracted uranium, and you leach it out with sulfuric acid, and you make this stuff called yellow cake. There's a little picture of it. It's also known as uranium oxide. And then, yellow cake is turned into uranium hexafluoride gas, which can be cooled to make a solid so that you can transport it and also compress it down a lot, and so then that saves on storage costs. So that's how uranium starts out, but if you want to turn it into something that can be weaponized, you then have to enrich the uranium. And what that means is you have to enrich the fraction of the uranium-235 compared to what you would naturally find to make it useful for your purposes. Once you get up to, from that less than 1%, once you get the quantity of uranium-235 up to 5%, you can make power plants out of that kind of uranium that's called low enriched uranium, or LEU. But once you get more than 90% of that isotope, 235, compared to all the other isotopes, which are basically 238, that's the highly enriched uranium that you need to make weapons. And so there are many different ways you can do that enriching of this isotope ratio. One common way in places that have a lot of energy to spare is the gas centrifuge method. And that is the method that Iran uses. Part of the whole Iran nuclear deal, another thing I don't have time to talk about, was to limit the number of centrifuges that Iran would have operating to do that enrichment process. Okay, well that's the deal that the current administration pulled out of, so they're still obeying the deal because Europe didn't pull out of the deal, all the European countries, but just saying. They have thousands of these stages of these centrifuges and they were not using them all and they could just turn them back on again at any point. Um, so there, because of the weight difference, when you have a centrifuge, because of the weight difference, the heavier stuff will get flung to the outside and can be peeled off, and the lighter stuff stays in the middle, and then you do another stage, and a little more gets peeled off, and do another stage. And they have to go through hundreds to thousands of stages to really get the uranium enriched to the 90, greater than 90 percent level. You can also do gaseous diffusion. That's the method that we use to do our uranium enrichment here in this country. 
and that works on the principle that the lighter things travel faster, so if you're diffusing, they can go through things and get away from the heavier ones that are slower. And also needs lots and lots of stages. And then this one, electromagnetic isotope separation, was something that nobody in this country would ever have used because we're not sitting on a whole big oil field. But it turns out that after the first Gulf War, when they found the hidden nuclear facilities in, in Iraq, um, this is how they were doing their uranium enrichment, this electromagnetic isotope separation. It's a very energy intensive thing. We should put things in a big, strong electric field and separate them that way. Um, and so we weren't looking for that, right? So we were looking for evidence that they were doing the things that we would have done. But they weren't, because they had huge oil fields that could provide lots of power to do the work. And so they did it this way that we weren't even thinking of. And as a historical talk, I learned about this because we had a historical talk in this series by Jay Davis, who worked at Livermore, and who was one of the people that went to Iraq after the First Gulf War and discovered those things. And you can go back and look at our historical records, but he's also written some articles about it if you look him up. Um, absolutely fascinating. Okay, well, marching along here. So, so there's a piece of uranium that's one inch long, weighs 10 grams. Um, here's two, 235 uranium. Okay, it's the major ingredient that you need for chain reactions, and you see there's you know, three less neutrons. But uranium is very, very dense. And when you're done with that enrichment and you've kept all the uranium-235 and you put it somewhere where you can turn it into a weapon or, or a power plant fuel, uh, all the depleted uranium, the uranium that was left over that's been depleted of the uranium-235, it's almost all uranium-238, that has been used to make armor of tanks and uh, the structures of the bonds themselves, because it's very heavy and very dense material. So it's, a, you know, you'd think, well, great, we'll make a tank out of it, and then, you know, we'll have this nice impenetrable tank. Except it's still radioactive, and so anybody that's sitting in a tank made of depleted uranium is exposing themselves to health risks from the danger of being exposed to the radioactivity. So that's a whole other talk. I also don't have time to give that one, but I have given that one in the past about the health effects of, of depleted uranium. And also all those tanks that were left behind in the Gulf Wars that were all made of that, and then they were all like on fire, and all the stuff is going up in the air. And Anyway, it's just a big, nasty mess. So I just wanted to clear up some of that jargon for you. Okay, so now what about fission weapons? Now this is a talk about the physics of the weapons, not the engineering. So I don't really know how to make a bomb, but I'll tell you what I do know about how the bombs work. So if you have an element, so if you have a star, and it's burning fuel in its core, it can make the elements up to iron. But to get energy out of elements heavier than iron, what you have to do is fizz them, fission them, break them up, by bombarding them with neutrons. Okay, so here's our uranium-235, and we're going to shoot some neutrons at it, and it's going to break into a bunch of pieces of stuff, and it's going to release more neutrons, and then if you can catch these neutrons and send them back around to the uranium-235, then you can get a chain reaction going that will continue this process, because every time you split it, you get more neutrons, and just catch them, send them back in, and eventually the whole thing just blows up. And that is what happens in the first atomic weapons like Gadget or Trinity or Little Boy or Fat Man. So these were all A-bombs, atomic bombs, fission bombs. This is a, a more scale models of, of Little Boy and Fat Man uh, in the museum in New Mexico where they explain a lot of this stuff. And so the interesting thing to notice here is that the yields of all of these were in the 15 to 20 kiloton range. So that's thousands of tons of conventional chemical explosives, right? So we always quote the yield as the equivalent of how much of a regular like TNT dynamite kind of explosive you need to make that energy. 
that came out of that bomb. They don't actually tell you the energy, they just give you the yield in terms of conventional uh, chemical explosives. And so for, for the atomic bombs, this 20 kiloton yield is basically what you get out of about a piece of uranium about this big, like two pounds. So it only takes basically a grapefruit size chunk of uranium-235 to be the equivalent of 20,000 tons, and a ton is 2,000 pounds, right? So 20 million pounds of conventional explosive, which, you know, would fill more than this room, right? And here you have just this little ball of uranium that can give you that much energy. It's sort of amazing when you think about it. So how do you make an atomic bomb? Well, first you have to get your enriched uranium. Then you have to somehow squeeze it and confine it evenly and catch the neutrons that are coming out of those initial reactions, sending them back in to make the chain reaction with the uranium-235. And so it takes a bomb to make a bomb. And it, usually you start with the chemical one. And then you use the chemical one to trigger the next stage, which in this case would be the fission reaction. So the little boy style, they had some uranium-235 over here and some more over here. This is the shotgun style. You had your chemical explosive here, there's your gunpowder, and something that's going to inject neutrons into that. So you light this thing up, you smash those two halves together, you inject some neutrons at the same time. You have this tamper, this casing, around the whole thing, holding it together and catching those extra neutrons and sending them back in again, and this all happens in about a microsecond, and then it can't hold it together anymore, and then the bomb goes off. Okay, and there's just a picture from Hiroshima of the A-bomb. It's called the A-bomb dome. It's just like some ruins that were left behind. Okay, so for the Fat Man style, and also this was the style for Trinity, these were spherical. So then what we have is we have the uranium-235 in the middle, and we have the chemical explosive all around the outside, and then you have a casing all around that. And at the center of this, it's not shown in the picture, but the center of this is usually this thing called a polonium golf ball, which is a little piece of polonium that has a lot of extra neutrons. And so it could squeeze the neutrons coming out, and that starts the chain reaction Right, so you squeeze, you're, you're squeezing on it by imploding all of this chemical explosive in a perfectly symmetric and even way, so that it squeezes down the uranium-235 in the middle to critical mass, and then that squeezes the neutron generator, polonium golf ball thing in the middle, you get a big burst of neutrons, at the same time you're squeezing the thing together, and that starts the chain reaction until the thing blows up a little bit later. So, yes, the burst of neutrons is time for the moment of maximum compression. So that's your basic A-bomb, how they work. Just the physics. I don't really know the exact engineering. Any questions about that before I change gears? Well, since there was two types, I noticed the timeline. That's really quick. I mean, you know, okay. talking about the end of World War right. II, like you develop it and let's let's get it out and yeah. And, and so they the did the test with Trinity, <coughs> and that was the Fat Man style. And then they were like, oh, let's try the other style. So then they did the little <coughs> style, which is the bond they dropped in Hiroshima. And then you would have thought, okay, we could quit now because we've proven that both designs work. But then, for whatever political reason, the war wasn't ending or something, or they just had another bomb lying around and they didn't want to waste it, they decided to do the Fat Man style over again and drop it on, on Nagasaki. So. so they had tested the... They had already tested that style. There was really no reason to test it again. That was the, the Trinity test. So. How does the hydrogen bomb work? Okay, we're, that's the next... <laughs> That's the next one. We didn't, we didn't was that the it. rationale, the initial one, to test it, not to end the war? Well, I mean, they the claimed that the war wasn't going to end if they didn't drop yet right. another bomb. I mean, that was the political reason. I, this is a physics talk. I'm not all that great on the politics. But yes, there was lots of different rationales going on back then about why you needed to do the Nagasaki 
um, bomb drop, and you already destroyed Hiroshima, and you already knew that other design worked, so I didn't know. You know. But Hiroshima was a test of that style. Hiroshima is the test of the of the shotgun style. Yeah. That had not been That had, that not, had not been, been tested done. at El Nogorio. No, because the only test at El Nogorio was Trinity. And then as you saw from that timeline, right? Right? So this was just like three weeks later and then this was like three days later. <laughs> one test and two active Right. One test and two active just dis dis cities. Of cities. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, moving on to the fusion weapons. So we have our little happy sun guy here. Because fusion is what naturally occurs in the center of our sun. But in the case of our sun, it's the huge mass of the sun that's holding everything together to allow these reactions to occur. Um, if you're lighter than iron, the way you're going to get energy out of your nucleus is you have to put two things together. But those two things, those two deuterium atoms in this case, which remember were basically hydrogen with an extra neutron, they don't want to be together because they have plus charges in both nucleus, both nuclei. Right? So you have to overcome that Coulomb repulsion and get those two plus charges to get close enough that they will fuse. Right? That's not that easy to do. People keep trying to make commercial fusion reactors. They keep trying to work on fusion processes in the lab to try to someday make a commercial fusion reactor just like all of our current power plants are fission reactors. And they have not been able to do it successfully so far, by which I mean they haven't been able to get stuff to fuse for less energy to put into the fusion and you get out from the fusion reaction. Right? So they haven't reached the break-even point with the fusion process where you get more energy to <coughs> put in. Otherwise, you don't get a very good power plant. Right? <laughs> So, um, so the basic ingredients here for the fusion reactions are this heavy hydrogen, very heavy hydrogen and lithium, the next element on the periodic table. There it is over there. Um, and these make these so-called H-bombs or hydrogen bombs, right? They're H because deuterium and tritium are both forms of hydrogen. And also, these fusion reactions are what we call thermonuclear reactions, which just means that they make a lot of heat. And the more heat you make, the faster the reactions run, which then makes more heat, which then makes the reactions run faster, and you get your runaway in that kind of feedback loop between the heat and the ingredients. And so then you would need less fuel, which gives you a more efficient bomb, because you get this boosted reaction rate from the extra heat. <coughs> OK, so what's the secret of the H-bomb? Well, back, back when I was first learning about this stuff, um, this was a whole big scandal because the secret of the H-bomb was published in a bunch of newspapers. And, um, and now, of course, you can just read it anywhere on the internet. But, you know, 20 years ago when I first started giving this talk, this secret was not known. But I'll tell you what the secret is. The secret is light travels faster than particles that you've just blown up. Right? Because light travels faster than everything. And x-rays are a form of, a form of light. And so what happens is you start off with, um, for example, the primary bomb. So here's, here's a bomb that is like a fission bomb, and it's triggered by a chemical bomb inside, so it's very much like the Fat Man style. And then as this one starts to blow up, it puts out a lot of x-rays. And the x-rays come down here, and they bounce off the inside of the tamper, or the casing, and they exert radiation pressure because they're x-rays, so they're light, so they have radiation pressure. And they squeeze this stuff before it does it. And then that helps this stage ignite, the secondary stage ignites, in part due to the pressure of the x-rays bouncing off the casing and squeezing down on the material to make it critical. And so that is basically the secret. Okay, so the x-rays squeeze it, they heat this channel, it compresses it, and it ignites this second stage, which has is, which is got the fusion material in it, um, before this thing blows the whole thing up. So the explosions are happening before the bomb hits the ground? That's oh, yeah. Yeah, all of this reaction stuff is happening. Usually, it's more effective to do it in the air anyway, yeah. and I'll show you why as we get to the effects part. But there's all sorts of tricks you can play if you're a bomb designer. For example, here's, here's this 
thing. This is a 1999 San Jose Mercury News. So it really is 20 years ago that this thing was published in the newspapers first, the secret stuff. Okay, so this, this particular warhead has these two stages and, um, and the, the fission stage is the primary and this is actually plutonium fission boosted with tritium. So, I mean, you play all these games, you can mix up the fusion and the fission. You, the fission can boost the fusion, the fusion can boost the fission, and all these different ingredients for get, if you're getting really fancy bomb designs. And then the second stage is the so-called Teller Ulam fusion device. This is Edward Teller, who was at Livermore and at Stanford um, for his career. So you can read all the details here, but but basically, this is a fission bomb, this is a fusion bomb. Um, this make the x-rays come down here and help that thing go critical. The x-rays from the first stage help the second stage go critical. So, um, yes. Boosted fission. The fission's boosted by having some fusion in it. And the fusion is triggered by having the fission bomb next to it. And so you can imagine that all these designs can get pretty complicated. And of course, I don't know any of the classified details, so I'm just showing you what you can find on the internet right. about the actual designs. I mean, I, this is fascinating. I felt like I knew stuff about this, but to know that the, I want to see if this is correct, right? To do this at the second stage, you know, I'm thinking of like the physics that I knew about the compression. They probably did all these tests, and it always blew up the fusion components. You couldn't get the fusion components to compress. Yes, you could imagine that could be a testing cycle. Probably. That was a you know likely a testing cycle, and it was the the, the, the photons and and right. So getting so getting the radiation to come around and do the compression in a spherical way, so that you can actually trigger that second weapon, right? Because if you squeeze a little too hard this way, it'll all go that way, right? And then the thing will just blow up without finishing the process. I just want to mention, I talked in my optics class, it's hard to change the direction of, of x-rays, and you have to have these glancing right. blows. So, so off a very dense material that's highly polished on the inside, just like x-ray telescopes or x-ray mirrors. Okay, so that's how you build the bombs. So why are atomic bombs or hydrogen bombs so much worse than chemical bombs? Well, first, the amount of heat and light energy that you release is at least a thousand times greater. But more worrisome is that the explosion itself is accompanied by invisible penetrating and harmful radiation. And that radiation persists and turns into what we usually call radioactive fallout and it will persist in the atmosphere for days to weeks to years. And in fact, it's still up there from all the bomb tests in the 1960s that were done in the air. There's still a layer of irradiated atmosphere up there far enough. That's just our ground level view of the Hiroshima cloud. So here, in case you've not seen it, and hopefully this will work sound-wise, Oh, of course, maybe I have the sound turned off on my actual computer. Yeah, and this is low. Yeah, no, I... Oh, yeah, there it is. All right, so there it is. So there you see, so see all that stuff getting sucked up there? And see that big get, ball of hot gas rising? It's going to keep rising until the pressure of that hot gas is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere, right? And the pressure of the atmosphere is less as you go up. And that's what makes the mushroom. All right, so you got a big hot ball of gas, hot air expands, hot anything expands, hot plasma in this case. As it expands, it's evacuating the area underneath it, so that makes a vacuum that sucks all the stuff up from the ground to make the stem of the mushroom. But the hot air itself rises like a ball until it gets equal, because the pressure of the air around it is more, so it's keeping it in the ball shape until it gets up to where there's less pressure when you get high enough in the atmosphere, and then there isn't pressure pushing on this ball shape of gas, and then it spreads out and becomes like a mushroom top, in case you're wondering where the mushroom shape comes from. Okay? So the first effect is, of course, just the incredible heat from just blowing this thing up. It's, you know, millions of degrees. To make x-rays, you need, you need at least 10 million degrees hot plasma. That heat can become a fireball that can then make firestorms because the heat expands and just all the buildings nearby 
don't need 10 million degrees to light on fire, so they just start burning and then it just pushes out the firestorm. Okay, explain the mushroom crowd. Um, so the radiation, the invisible penetrating harmful radiation that comes out from these nuclear reactions includes alpha particles, which is just another name for W ionized telium nuclei, beta particles, which is another name for positrons and electrons, gamma rays, which are an even more energetic form of light than x-rays, and fast-moving neutrons. And all of these things are harmful to people. Okay, and they all come out and you can't see any of them, but they can go right through your skin. And in fact, alpha particles are more deadly to people than electrons, for example. Neutrons at least are neutral, so they're not interacting quite as much, although the fast-moving neutrons can also be very dangerous. And then, you just made this huge ball of gas where there didn't used to be one. That makes a shock front. And it makes a pressure shock front that moves out. Okay? A pressure blast wave. And that just collapses all the buildings. And then, the, all those radioactive particles, the beta particles and the, and the alpha particles and the neutrons, they all stick to the particles of the air or the dirt that got sucked up that mushroom stem. And then it spreads out, and then they all start to fall down. All those dust particles that are now irradiated start to fall down all over the world. And 80% of it falls back down in the first day, 90% falls back down in the first week, and then the rest of it is still up there, basically. So there's a picture of some destroyed buildings, there's a picture of a destroyed person. Um, if you want to see what happens from a certain size bomb on your city, Google nuclear weapons effects calculator. And you can pick your size of bomb and it will show you the radius within which everything will get destroyed, basically. And let's just say that for a pretty modest sized bomb, like the kind that, that we dropped on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, if you did the same thing, it would take out all of San Francisco and pretty much the whole Bay Area. Um, so how far away would you have to be to like, live after it like, burns like that, I guess, for the Nagasaki? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of other issues, right? So there's the nuclear winter issue that you put all this garbage up in the atmosphere and it kills the sunlight and then no plants grow. So maybe it doesn't even matter how far away you live because all the plants are dead now. And then there's this. The electromagnetic pulse. Okay, so here's another thing that happens. So you just ionized a huge chunk of air, and normally air doesn't conduct electricity very well, although you might argue with me if you lived in a place where there were winters and you shuffled across the carpet so much to touch doorknobs, you would you would experience a little bit of ionization of the air as you finger shock the doorknob. But that isn't terribly painful. Um, but if you ionize a huge amount of air, then that plasma, the air is turned into plasma, that conducts electricity extremely well. And so where does it, con and now you've got all these electrons floating around through the air, and they're just going to go and find your nearest power line, and make a huge power surge on your entire power grid, and go into the grid and destroy everything that's connected to it. <coughs> So it doesn't matter too much how far away you, you, you live because you probably won't have any electricity afterwards. Okay. Um, in 1962, when they were still testing bombs in the air, a uh, 1.4 megaton airburst knocked the lights out in Hawaii a thousand miles away. And here's a little, here's a little um, thing. So if you set the bomb off 30 miles above the ground, the electromagnetic pulse will take out everything within a 500 mile radius, but if you raise the height above the atmosphere even further, you can just have one bomb and it'll wipe out the grid for the whole US. So, um, something to think about. And, and it doesn't even have to be attached to the grid. If anybody remembers, there was this movie about Kansas and they had these people with cars that were sitting there and all of a sudden their cars died because, and especially nowadays with everything being computer powered, all the new cars, right? All those little chips in your computers, no matter whether they're attached to a grid or not, they're all toast. 
I mean, they are just going to get zapped and destroyed, and none of that stuff will work. So it doesn't even have to be attached to the grid. Just the pulse coming through the air will wipe out pretty much anything electrical that we have. Certainly all of our modern technology. And the people that, that work on computer boards, they have to ground themselves just because that little static shock, like the doorknob, is enough to kill your computer chip. So imagine how much damage this kind of electromagnetic pulse can do to any electrical devices. How, for that illustration, how large is the, uh, is the device? Oh, it's just your typical size, you know. 10 or 100 kilotons doesn't even matter. I mean, you can look it up. I forget, but it's, it's just a typical size one. It's not a particularly big one. Yeah. So, so why do we think nuclear weapons are scary? It's because they really are scary, right? Most of the effects are due to radiation, so you can't smell them or see them. Um, the damage to yourself by the, all that penetrating radiation, the alpha particles, the fast neutrons, etc., can't, those cancers can take 20 years, or, if you're not killed right away, you can still die of cancer 20 years later from all the genetic damage that you have. And forget about having kids if you live through that and were zapped by all that radiation. That's not a good plan. Um, a single bomb like Hiroshima or Nagasaki, those small ones that we used to launch, can kill 100,000 people just with one bomb. That's way more than a conventional missile can do. It also doesn't take very much material, right? Just a couple pounds to make an explosion that can kill 100,000 people. However, it does take a lot of engineering to make a bomb that actually works. And so keep that in mind when we're talking about um, North Korea. So the sizes of the weapons nowadays, um, so remember, one, one kiloton is 1,000 tons, which is 2 million pounds of the equivalent of chemical explosive. It only takes 2 pounds to make a 20 kiloton weapon. Today's typical warheads are 100 to 200 kilotons. But back when we were testing, we were testing single warheads that had megaton range. And there were over 1,700 known tests in that era. Almost all of which were in the atmosphere before people realized that the stuff was not disappearing. It was going to stay up there, some percentage of it, you know, stuck to particles in the upper stratosphere, troposphere, one of those spheres up there. Um, and and the, the most recent North Korean tests were in the range of 50 to 250 kilotons. And we can tell because we can measure the earthquakes. They're testing underground. We can measure the size of the earthquakes that are made by the seismic waves from the bomb. So what about those North Koreans, as I'm getting, getting to the end here. Um, yes, good timing. Okay, so 2006 is when North Korea first reported its uh, first underground test. And that was just a tiny earthquake, and we think that one was only maybe half a kiloton. And the International Atomic Energy Agency believes that they have made enough weapons-grade plutonium to make at least five to 15 bombs. So that's because if you have power plants running, then all of your spent fuel turns in, a lot of it turns into plutonium. You can then reprocess that plutonium, get it out of the spent fuel rods, and turn it into weapons. So there is definitely a connection between peaceful uses of atomic energy and ca catching that waste products and turning it into weapons. Hence, the alarm recently raised just last week about trying to get Saudi Arabia to have some nuclear power plants. That was something that the current administration has been working on. So in 2009, they had another test, and this one was about 15 kilotons. And then in 2010, they said that they had managed to achieve nuclear fusion. Now, when we're just looking at earthquakes made by weapons, we can't tell what kind of bomb just made it, if it's fission or fusion. So I guess we would have to take their word on that. Um, it might really only have been a boosted fission weapon. This is a weapon where you've got deuterium or tritium inside of a shell of uranium or plutonium that will maybe double the, the effective yield. And so, depending on whose measurements you're taking, just based on the earthquake patterns and the seismograph readings, that's where the 50 to 250 kiloton measurement came out. Different experts have different answers. But still, much bigger than than Hiroshima. 
And this is the path that we think they've taken to develop their weapons. So this is from a New York Times article. First, you tried to make a, an implosion atomic bomb, right? So this is like Fantman, like Hiroshima. Then you put some boosting inside, right? So you put some deuterium or tritium inside to boost the fission weapon. And then you can actually make one where you've got a whole layer of deuterium or tritium, and then you've got some other stuff inside, and so now you've got a three-layer bomb. And finally, you can get to a hydrogen bomb where you have the atomic weapon triggering the fusion weapon down below. And we, we do think that North Korea has gone through this entire chain of development based on the yield that they have been getting. But then you also need to be able to launch the bomb at somebody, right? So what have they done in terms of satellites and missiles? Well, in 2012 and 2016, they managed to launch some satellites into Earth orbit, right? So if you have a rocket and you put a, and you put a satellite on it and you can steer the rocket so that you can launch things, then it becomes a missile. That's what we call missiles, steerable rockets. All the rockets I do with my students, you don't steer those. They have missiles. We're not allowed to do that. You just, they just go up and down with Newton's laws. <laughs> okay, but if you can steer it, then you got yourself a missile. And the 2016 satellite is still up there, and it was a clear violation of the UN resolutions, and so then they gave them all these sanctions. Um, but then through to 2017, from 2016, they were launching missiles every two to four weeks. And this is a picture of one of their launches, and this is a picture of their launching tower. And in 2017, they were actually able to get missiles to go far enough that it was getting seriously scary. Because these Hwasong-12 missiles were able to go over Japan. And in fact, they did. They launched them right over Japan, totally freaking out the Japanese, as you might imagine. So they were flying right over Hokkaido, two different tests um, in, the year two, in the year 2017. And so we now estimate that they have a range for their missiles between 7,000 and 9,000 kilometers, and from North Korea to California is about 9,000 kilometers. Hence the worries of the people on our coast, our west coast, that we could be within striking distance. And so um, if you go really high up, you don't get as far. But if you launch at a lower trajectory, then you can go farther. And you're going to launch your records, um, your, your rockets. But mostly, they were having a lot of trouble launching their rockets. And mostly, they were blowing up before 2016. And so we weren't too worried until 2016. And then all of a sudden, they started to work really well. And the reason we think that all of a sudden they got better is because they seem to have gotten their rocket engines from the Russians. So when the Soviet Union broke up, there were a lot of rocket building companies and they used to sell their rockets to the central USSR government. But now there was just Russia and Russia didn't want to buy that many more bombs or many, many more rockets, rocket engines. And so these companies had all these spare rocket engines lying around, and they were looking for market, and um, apparently the, the Russian gangsters were like funneling these rocket engines to, out of the country to other countries. And so we think a lot of them, made by this company, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, um, we think a lot of them went to North Korea. So this just sort of shows what they used to look like. And then, um, you know, here's, here's some more good pictures of, of what the rocket engines look like that all of a sudden started working. So that's sort of scary. Yeah, the government stopped buying them in 2006. And the company was really, really broke by 2016. So then they were like, OK, let's just sell off some of them and try get some of our money back instead of having these things in the warehouse. All right, so what's going on now? This is the only peace part of my talk. What's going on now in terms of um, diplomacy? So one really good thing is that Kim, Kim Jong-un, who's in charge of North Korea, and 
Moon Jae-in, who's in charge of South Korea, are having inter-Korean summits. Unless it's intra, or whatever the right, whichever the right direction is. Anyway, just with North Korea and South Korea are just meeting together to try to make some kind of plans. And those things have been occurring pretty regularly, and despite what's going on with the US versus North Korea summits, these summits are continuing, and they are continuing to make progress. Then, of course, as I'm sure you've heard, um, uh, Kim Jong-un and President Trump met in June 2018 and agreed, quote, to work towards complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And then Trump left that summit and said they're no longer a threat because they fell in love. And then they scheduled the second summit, which just happened a couple weeks ago. And then that one just totally fell apart and they didn't sign anything. And I don't know, maybe the romance is over. It's hard to say. But after the first summit, North Korea announced it was halting its missile and nuclear testing and it would dismantle several key sites. And in fact, as far as we can tell, they have not resumed testing. Um, they also signed a pledge to close one of their test facilities. They blew up some tunnels. They said they were willing to shut down their really big enrichment facility if we would do something nice for them. And then the nice things that we did do was we stopped having joint military exercises with South Korea. And they gave us back 55 crates of remains from the Korean War. Um, but meanwhile, they just continued to build intercontinental ballistic missiles, even though they said they weren't going to anymore, but they did. And so then we had the second summit recently, and Trump said that it failed because they wanted to complete us to completely end our sanctions against them without them fully denuclearizing. But meanwhile, North Korea claimed that they would dismantle the same plant that they said they were dismantled before, if we would just get rid of the economic sanctions, but nothing, no agreement was reached. But we have documented proof that they are still building new nuclear facilities in North Korea, and they started right after the first summit ended. Um, and, you know, we can see those things. We have spy satellites. You know, on a happy note, no one, they, they have not gone back to testing, and we are still not conducting military exercises in the Korean Peninsula. So here's an example of some work that they did right after the first summit in July 2018. There's a trailer that can hold an intercontinental ballistic missile at their missile assembly facility. So this is the kind that could reach us, right, intercontinental. This is the kind that has the range to reach the U.S. So what do they want? Like what could we bargain with them about? Well, they would still like us to officially end the Korean War, which has just been in this armistice state since the 1950s. They would truly love it if we would remove the economic sanctions that have basically made all of the North Koreans about four inches shorter than all of the South Koreans because they're all starving to death and they don't have any good food or nutrition. They would surely love it if we would take our troops out of South Korea. They would, of course, like to reunify the South Korea, but I'm not so sure how okay, happy South Korea would be about that, but sort of like East Germany and West Germany after the Cold War, right? The East Germans were all starving and they had no industry, and the West Germans were all thriving, you know, modern society. They eventually got over it and got together. Um, and now both halves of the country are, are pretty good, except for the Eastern part still sort of ugly. Um, anyway, um, they would like to be respected as a nuclear power. Well, I think they've convinced everybody they are a nuclear power. And um, they claim they would like everybody to be denuclearized, but I'm not holding my breath for that one. Are we in danger from them? Right? So in order for them to really threaten us, they must have a tested bomb design. Yes, check. Tested long-range delivery system. Check. We don't know about these ones because they haven't really launched a bomb at anybody. We don't know whether they can um, if you launch the thing up and it starts to come down and it's time to blow it up, did your thing hold together as it re-entered the atmosphere? Right? So if you want to go intercontinental, you go out of the atmosphere, you go back in the atmosphere, you want to blow it up when you get over here, right? But if, if the heat shield fails and it doesn't work, then you just get a dirty bomb and you get pieces scattered all over but no actual explosion. Um, 
you have to be able to steer that missile. You have to have the electronics to be able to do that targeting. And that means miniaturized electronics in the nose cone. You have to have that guidance system, and of course you have to actually want to bomb somebody. So what do you think? We will, we will adjourn there, and you can all think about that. I, there's lots of uh, notes here as well, places you can go for more resources if you want to learn more. Before the hour, so I'd like to have um, a few minutes of questions before we um, have a short break for a long extended question and answer session. So let's see if we can get a couple of questions with the whole group. Uh, no pressure that this has to be an important question. Uh, if a bomb was launched at the U.S., would, is there any way for the U.S. to stop it? Okay, so that's a good question. If somebody launched a bomb at us, could we stop it? Well, that sort of depends on what kind of bomb it was and how it was launched. So originally, when I was thinking about working at Livermore, um, that was the era of Ronald Reagan as president and Star Wars or what became known as Star Wars, because that's also when the movie was popular, but it was really called the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that was an idea where the Russians, with their fixed silos and their intercontinental ballistic missiles, we knew exactly where they were coming from, so if they launched them, we would know exactly where they were going to go. We would launch something and take it out before it got to us. Now you have a really long time to do that because it's coming all the way from Russia and it's being launched from some place that's fixed in the ground and you know where it is. So that was at least theoretically possible, although all of the studies that the physicists did at the time said, oh, we'll never be able to do that. You know, that's just, it's just really very difficult technical challenge. And so then there were also kinetic kill vehicles and laser beams you could shoot at them and you didn't have to plow into it, you could just like zap it with some lasers or throw a bunch of stuff in the way and confuse this guidance system and make it smash into the stuff instead of going where it was supposed to go. And there were all these ideas that people had about doing that. But that, that huge phase in that huge amount of time that you have to get to intercept something coming from Russia, that doesn't work if you're launching a small missile from a submarine somewhere off the coast and you don't even know where it's coming from. Right? So if you have a submarine launch ballistic missile or if you have a, a ballistic missile on something that's moving around in your country, that makes the targeting and intercept process, you know, that much more difficult, like impossible. And so that's why not a lot of work has been done on Star Wars or SDI since those days because people that did those studies concluded it just wasn't going to work that well. Um, also, you know, since it takes so little material to make a weapon, you can just put one in a suitcase and you can just take it into some country and smuggle it in somehow, right? If you're not x-raying everything that's coming through the ports to find <coughs> traces of radioactivity or whatever. And so how you can't possibly intercept those, you can't even find them until it's too late. So, yes, people are still thinking about it. They, Trump has started the Space Force now because he wants to militarize space, even though space has not been militarized previously. The idea would be some kind of return to the Star Wars thinking that somehow we're going to have these things up there waiting for someone to shoot bombs at us and take them all out before they get there. And it's, it's really, really a hard problem. And I don't think anybody has any good solutions. Let's do one more question for the break. Uh, well, anything that creates a little ionized plasma, plasma ball can make a little bit of a pulse. If just to make a super huge one that's really destructive, takes a big um. Right? But you can, you know, you can make that little. I mean, anytime you shock a doorknob, you are ionizing the air in just that little tiny area. Right, so that is like a little tiny electromagnetic pulse, that breakdown of the air as, as the shock goes from your finger to the doorknob or back to you. Right, but to make one on purpose basically requires an instantaneous ionization of the air, which means you know, a whole bunch of energy has to make that air turn into plasma from plain old neutral molecules for just a split second. We're going to continue after short break. Could you explain the difference between that kind of radiation and nuclear radiation? Okay, so, so as everybody that's a physics major knows, light has an entire frequency spectrum, all the way from radio waves to gamma rays. 
And it's only when you get to things that are higher energy than visible light, well, visible light can damage people, that's what sunburns are, right? But you also get sunburns from the ultraviolet part. So mostly people think of the harmful radiation as being anything with more energy than visible light. Because if you shine a flashlight on yourself, it doesn't really hurt or anything. But if you shine an ultraviolet source on yourself for long enough, you will definitely get a sunburn, right? So as the wavelengths of the light get shorter, their ability to penetrate the skin goes up. And so that's why we take x-rays of people's broken bones with x-rays, right? And we don't tend to use gamma rays too much in a medical setting, although if you've heard of this thing called the cyber knife, a lot of, um, a lot of tumor targeting is done with beams of directed gamma rays that all converge on wherever your tumor is, right? So you put a, gamma, put a bunch of gamma ray beams through your head, not enough to destroy the brain as it goes through, but if they all meet at one spot, and deposit their energy at the tumor, then you can take out the tumor with the so-called cyber knife, right? So it's like converging gamma ray beams in your head kind of thing. So ionizing radiation, in other words, anything that's more energetic than visible light is the more harmful kind. That doesn't mean that microwaves can't harm you, the whole, you know, poodle thing. Um, you know, microwaves vibrate the water in your soup or, or whatever. And so, you know, if you were in a microwave, all of the water in your body would, you know, be heating you up pretty quickly. So that could be dangerous as well. But people don't tend to go sit in microwaves. So that's not a commonly <coughs> occurring problem. Um, but, but your cell phones and TVs and, you know, that projector, everything makes RF, makes radio waves. They're very long waves, they're very unenergetic on a per photon basis, and they're not generally regarded as harmful because they don't penetrate the skin and they can't ionize your cells to make tumors or cancer sites. So, but, but radiation is not just light. It's not just electromagnetic radiation because people called, they didn't know what they were, but they called them alpha, beta, and gamma rays. They thought they were all three different kinds of radiation. Gamma rays are the only ones that are really light. The alpha particles were helium nuclei. The beta particles were electrons or positrons. Those have mass. They don't travel as fast, but if you give them enough energy and they're traveling fast enough, they can go through your skin and they can deposit and cause, you know, start tumors. Right? So other things in the colloquial public are called radiation that are not necessarily electromagnetic radiation, right? There's particle radiation, and of course, sometimes light acts like a wave and sometimes light acts like a particle, so that just confuses it further. But yeah, but there are other things that we, that we call radiation. We're talking about bombs like alphas and betas that are, also can cause serious damage, even though they have mass and they're not, not a form of light. Yes, we can see. Um, so say there was a nuclear bomb, um, and you said when they're traveling to different continents, they have to exit the atmosphere. You go up out of the atmosphere, and what you travel through if, space, and you come back through the atmosphere what, again. What would happen if it um, was ignited while it was outside of the atmosphere? Would there be any effect on this? Oh, I mean, it would still ignite. It would still make a pressure wave, but it would be someplace that it would be far enough away that hopefully not much would happen. Right, so even the electromagnetic pulse needs to have the molecules of the air be ionized in order to get the currents into the power grid. So if you're up there where there's no air and there's no molecules, you just get a big blast wave, you still have an explosion, stars explode all the time in space where there's a vacuum, right? But it, it, it's not anything that, that tends to... So it'd be ideal to... Um, shoot it, if you're going to shoot it down or something, but, but see, shooting it down means you're not letting it have the nuclear explosion. So, um, so the whole concept of a dirty bomb is a bomb that's just filled with radioactive waste and it doesn't make a nuclear explosion. It just spews the waste everywhere and then you just have a big radioactive contamination problem wherever all that stuff landed. Right? So, that, so that's a totally different style of bomb that's still scary because it's radioactive but it doesn't make fallout and it doesn't make, um, you know, firestorms and pressure blast waves. It's just a normal sort of bomb that contaminates a lot of stuff because it's just through a bunch of radioactive material like hospital waste all over the place kind of thing. Well, I was going to say that sounds like a good way to get rid of depleted uranium. 
the best way, I mean, if you could afford it, is just put it all in rockets and send it into the sun. <laughs> then it can't hurt anything. <laughs> right? Just send it really far away, like out into space on a one-way ticket. But that's a pretty expensive way to clean up the nuclear waste problem. Especially when you consider there's just piles of nuclear waste sitting at pretty much every nuclear power plant in the entire world because nobody knows how to get rid of that. So we just let it sit there in pools, initially. With uh, the North Korean economy being so impoverished, where do they get the economic wherewithal to have this nuclear weaponry? They just do it, right? I mean, that's why the people are starving. They don't spend any money on anything else in their country other than the military. So I mean, every country has a certain amount of money or whatever. I mean, it's a choice. It's a political choice, right? Is any of their technology homegrown, or is it all purchased? I think it's mostly all sort of gifted or stolen or purchased for cheap from other countries that have already figured out how to do it. Um, at one point, didn't I think they had some Iranians or something advising them on how to build their stuff, right? So. The Pakistanis, I think. Or maybe it was the Pakistanis, or right? You know. Initially, their sponsors. Yeah, so there's, you know, there are states that know how to do it that, you know, like Pakistan or Iran that go around encouraging other bad acting countries to do it too. It's not, not a pretty picture, really. So when you mentioned the A bomb, uh, so people use uranium-235 and you bomb out uranium-235 with you know, a lot of uh, neutrons. Or well, isn't it true that uh, uranium-235 will actually absorb many neutrons to form uh, uranium-238? Well, and uh, now what it normally does is it breaks it apart first. So I guess so, it's sort of like a different uh, new yeah, reaction when yeah. you have uh, 235. Yeah, I mean, it. It's not that common because, you know, it's just, but it's much more fissile. It's, it, you need much, you know, it can reach critical mass and critical density and it just takes a few neutrons to blow it up, right? So there are certain um, elements that are just much better for making bombs out of, and uranium-235 happens to be a lot better than 238. They're both radioactive. If you're just sitting there and not disturbing them, they're both radioactive. But the half-life of uranium-238 is more than like 10 billion years, which is why it's still around in the rocks, right? So uranium-235 is a much shorter half-life. It's still long, but it's, that's, why this, that's why it's not around in the rocks very much. Uh, as a follow-up, how would you get neutrons by themselves to shoot at? Oh, well, you can just make a neutron generator. It's like a device that somehow generates neutrons. But yeah, that's a whole other story. But, or you can get this polonium golf ball things and crunch them and a bunch of neutrons will spring out. <laughs> I think that's probably one of those classified things that oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not that easy to find out, although I could try Googling it now. I bet you could find out all this stuff now compared to when I first tried to started to figure it out 20 years ago when there was no internet. Quinn. Hi. So I'm just curious, like, how receptive are, like, are, is military listening to, like, physicists talking about, like, the actual effects of, like, what these bombs can do? Um, are they really receptive, or is it just kind of like a, we're doing this because it's a political, well, it's one of the one of the nice things about the fact that I never had a security clearance is I can talk about whatever I want and nobody can give me a lot of grief about it. Um, my husband, on the other hand, he had a Q clearance for a long time and he used to work out at Livermore on astrophysics projects, and so he could never give a talk like this because he has had a security clearance, right? So, but but I never wanted to get one just so I could keep going around educating people about this kind of stuff. Um, but there's, I've never really had any per personal or professional pushback about the fact that it's sort of my hobby to educate people about this kind of stuff. Um, I just felt, you know, I studied the policies. I decided I could not participate in Star Wars. It was a totally stupid idea, and I probably wouldn't keep the job very long because they would want me to say, like, do Star Wars this way instead of that way, and I would be like, don't do Star Wars at all. It's really stupid. 
So I, I'm really glad that I then got to just work on a different satellite at Berkeley and I never had to go there because <laughs> they were going to pay me a lot of money. It took me about 10 more years before I made that much money in the academic world <laughs> for that job that I turned down. But, um, but it did launch my interest in learning about all of this stuff, which you know, I continue to educate people about, at least to the best of my unclassified ability. We had a talk in the series about nuclear winter and how that kind of changed things. That was, that's, once again, scientists informing the public. Could you speak a little bit to, to that, uh, the scientific push to, to explain yeah. uh, nuclear winter? So, so nuclear winter is what happens when you blow up everything and you put a whole bunch of stuff up in the atmosphere and it stays there and it keeps the sun from getting down to the ground to make the plants grow. And so then everything is like winter and then everybody starves to death. On the other hand, it would go a long way to combat global warming. I'm not recommending it as an approach. <laughs> but it's definitely, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a super hyped up version of what happened when Mount Pinatubo went off, right? So that volcano put all this stuff up in the air and it actually did slow global warming down for about three years. Because it was so much stuff that filtered the sunlight that it, it kept the, the warming curve from going up. It like plateaued and then of course the stuff all fell down eventually, and then it went, global warming started again. So nuclear winter, does it last like one season? No, nuclear winter would be so much stuff from everything on the, in the ground burning up and putting all the stuff in the, you know, that it would be for so long that we would run out of food and we would all die. Yeah. And it wouldn't be just like an isolated thing like one volcano going off, even though that was a big volcano. It would be like every like Russia and the U.S. both bond the heck out of each other's countries, destroyed everything, and put all that stuff up into the air. And it, everybody dies. And everybody dies on the whole planet, not just in those countries. Uh, so another thing, kind of Krakatoa, the volcano, when it blew up, it like uh, would destroy your jumps for anyone within 150 miles. So would nukes have that kind of effect? Well, that's part, of the, that's part of the pressure wave. It's part of the, the, the pressure blast wave is blowing out your drums. So yes, that, but you'd be dead. Yeah, so you wouldn't notice saying. that you couldn't <laughs> hear. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it, these, these, these effects, the firestorms, the pressure waves, all of that, I mean, they happen over, that's why I said Google nuclear effects weapons calculator, and, and you can see, I mean, it would take out the entire San Francisco Peninsula, just a single bomb. Everything would be flattened, you know, everybody would be killed. I mean, it's, it's pretty dramatic, you know, considering it's just this much stuff that's combusting. So, yeah, not a good. Is uranium being, still being actively mined? Here in the United States. Is uranium still being actively mined? I think it is. Yes. I do think it is because we still have power plants and other countries have power plants um, like France has lots of power plants, Japan has lots of power plants still. So you yeah, need to... It's still a big fight in New Mexico on the reservations. Yeah. But, but a, a worse fight is that nobody can figure out what to do with the waste that's been generated since the power plant started. And so it just sits there in pools, and sometimes they put it in cans, and they'd like to put the cans in concrete and put them in some mountain in Yucca, Yucca Mountain in Nevada. The problem is, we don't know, I mean, the half-lives of these things are millions of years. We don't know how to make a oil drum can to put stuff in that's going to last for months and years and not let anything out, right? So they're counting on the geology of those places, like Yucca Mountain to somehow encapsulate the stuff they want to put in there, but then they found that there's water flowing through there and it could corrode the metal cans. And anyway, so no one knows what to do, so they just leave it there. It still just sits there in all the different power plants. All over. Big mess, really. Is there any way that nuclear reactions or these kinds of explosions could be used to, like, um, instead of a, as an explosive, could it be used as like an engine, so like to propel something into space, or um, well, would it just so obliterate so it yeah, well, so people don't use it as an engine to launch the rockets, but what they do have um, on the planetary satellites are radioisotope thermal generators, RTG, 
generators on the satellites that just use the heat from a radioactive isotope to create the power that you need to run the satellite because you're too far from the sun to use big solar panels like we do on the satellites that go around the earth. So those radioisotope thermal generators that they put on like the Cassini mission and things like that, you know, they, they caused a lot of alarm among people who were worried that the, the rocket launch in Cassini would blow up and the radioisotope thermal generator would spew dirty bomb-like stuff all over the place. If it did blow up, but then of course it didn't, and so it went to Saturn and we don't have to worry about it anymore. But that was, um, that was a concern of some people, and especially some on this campus, who we won't mention, Project Sensor, we won't mention them. <laughs> because I had a big fight with them back when Cassini was being launched about whether this should be the number one sensor story and whether people should really be worried about humanity being obliterated because NASA was launching a radioisotope thermal generator. I wasn't personally worried about it, but others differed with me. I guess I have one more question, one question about, um, you know, in the 70s, when I was in elementary school, we had bomb shelter, like nuclear bomb shelter. And there was the whole duct tape thing too, do you remember right. that? Yeah, it's like, duct tape, get some duct the, tape. It goes off, you go down here. And, the and then duct tape on your windows. Supposed basement that I don't think actually exists now that I reflect on it. But um, now, like now, it seems even more, or threat seems even higher than then, given North Korea's ability to at least launch rockets to us. Um, do you think we're going to, I mean, is anyone going to implement that kind of thing? Are we going to go back to having bomb shelters and stuff? Well, well remember matter. what I said about 80% of the stuff comes down in the first day and 90% in the first week. Uh -huh. So really, if you can just stay indoors, Perfect. you know, for a week, you're going to miss most of the worst fallout stuff, assuming that the building you're in didn't get blown apart by the blast wave or burned by the firestorm. You know, if you're far enough away and you're just worried about the fallout, you stay indoors for a week, you probably have a good chance of surviving. Of course, you may not have anything to eat, but you know that's a whole other issue because <laughs> all the food will be contaminated, just like the food near Chernobyl is still contaminated. Anything that grows near there, or Fukushima, you can't grow anything near either one of those places, and that wasn't even an explosion. But there's still not growing right. food in those regions. So. With that, let's thank <laughs> Dr. Minsky.